Let's get this started here. Hey there, Joe. It's good to see you. Good to see you, Jack. You ready to uh, get some people really started and some amazing observations? Absolutely. Um, you know, today is a is the is a perfect day if you have not been in nature journaling before to start on this adventure that is going to blow your mind and completely change the world. If you're a longtime nature journaler, we may have some skills today that you can add to your bag of tricks or some ideas that will come to you about how you can become a mentor to other people and be able to teach that to other folks. Um, Joe Kenyon and I worked together for years at the California Academy of Sciences. It's really good to be with you again, Joe. Good to be with you too, Jack. And we're already getting questions coming in, uh, some about very specific techniques. The one, first one coming in that you want to, we'll touch base on later, will be how do I draw a white fox on a snowbank? Uh, those kind of things. Uh, I want to get to those amazing, uh, curious ways of seeing the world. They're already out there observing these things, and then they're thinking how they want to represent it. We're gonna we're gonna get you a couple of fox on the snowbank right here. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. That looks it's exactly like. Polar bear. Yeah, that's the one where my snow my polar bear is eating marshmallows in a blizzard. I that's <laughs> exactly same picture. Uh, the, people have similar uh, challenges and frustrations, uh, just like you and I, about how to push the media to match what they're thinking, and that isn't always the same thing as what they're seeing. And so I'm glad we're gonna talk a lot about thinking first and then trying to get the hand to to match the what the brain is trying to do well first of all let's let me start this off uh everybody welcome uh this is the earth day nature journaling with jack laws webinar with the snow land trust let's get started looks like there's about 250 people signed up for this webinar and i see that already almost 200 people have checked in it's ex i'm really excited that you can join us and share a bit of the 50th anniversary of earth day together hello to you all from snow land trust I'm Joseph Kenyon, and I work as a GIS manager, making maps and supporting geographic information systems for our staff, the Snow Land Trust, to acquire and steward special places. I'll be introducing today's presenter, John Muir Laws, and facilitating the fun with help from behind the scenes by my colleagues, Maria Ramos, Neil Ramos, Melissa Bennett, and, uh, in the community programs and the development department. Let me go over some housekeeping here. Here are some things you should know for a smooth event. You've probably heard of webinars being interrupted by pranks or by shocking participants with unsavory messages. We've shifted from our prior webinar format to a moderated one to, to help with this. To protect our guests, you and the presenter from shenanigans, your mics and cameras will be turned off and muted. Uh, today's webinar will end at 2.30. Jack's presentation will be about an hour long with a wrap up towards the end. We hope you can participate by submitting questions and comments. Use the red Q&A button at the bottom of the webinar window. This will appear when the presentation starts now. Click on that, type in your question, and we will see them. Sometimes questions come in pretty, path, pretty fast while the speaker is talking, or many people ask the same question. We'll merge those common themes together or share at a good moment for everyone's benefit. We'll also do our very best to answer all that we can. We encourage participation during the webinar and afterwards using social media or through provided links. The event is being recorded and there are many resources for you to pursue afterward that we will share with you. Um, let's uh, get into a little bit about the journaling part. Many people find that their love for the natural world goes hand in hand with the attention that they give it. I can't think of a better way to celebrate Earth Day in our combined effort to steward our big blue planet than expanding our ability to connect to it through nature journaling. As our presenter Jack will elaborate, nature journaling is a mindset and the journal is the workbench. Whatever you use to sketch or write or paint, there are these are the tools guided by that mindset so that we can be deliberately curious. Today we'll sharpen our skills of observation so that we can cut through the clutter that our brains carry around and obscure or filter our view. Jack and I met a couple decades ago through our shared love of sketching and teaching outdoors, and then worked together running a nature uh, science, <clears throat> pardon me, a citizen science program, observing the natural world tucked into the city. Jack and I went on to different grad schools after that, him to a scientific illustration and me to mapping science. Mapping and nature journaling are 
the mo almost the same thing, and they often overlap. Both mapping and nature drilling use pictures and labels and numbers to see patterns or connections in order to better understand what's around us. From a single poppy seed to how that poppy is distributed across California, the difference between those two types of skills is only scale. They both, what they both really do well is share what we know. This way, most of us, more of us can literally be on the same page. Coordinating like this makes us more effective when we team up to learn more, to explore or protect those special places around us. Jack Laws is a author, uh, artist, um, presenter, uh, scientist, an explorer uh, located here in the Bay Area. Uh, he's created many, many guides, uh, field guides, teaching materials, and hosts weekly presentations online and in person about nature journaling. So there's much more to follow up with after this. It's my pleasure to introduce John Muir Laws, Jack, and I look forward to seeing your questions and hopefully anything that this presentation inspires you to share. We'll see you towards the end, and I'll see you towards the end to wrap up and, and say goodbye. Thanks. Jack, it's all yours. All right, everybody. Um, let's, let's, let's dig into this. We've got a short period of time here. What I want to do is to, uh, oh, it says um, host disabled attendee sharing. Could you please uh, set so that I am able to share screens and those sorts of things with uh, everybody? We'll get right on that, Jack. Great. Um, so in a moment, I will be um, sharing you a brief presentation about what journaling is, how nature journaling happens, and why to do it. So we're going to look at the, uh, the what, the how, and the why of nature journaling. Um, then we are all together going to have a chance to, to do that. So what you're going to need is just a pencil and a journal or a blank piece of paper if you have one. Also, you're going to need to go to your refrigerator and find the most interesting vegetable that is still in there. So um, you're going to want some sort of anchor vegetable um, to uh, wrap our observations around. So you want some physical thing. If you don't have that, maybe grab a houseplant sitting somewhere nearby, but something that you can, something that you'll be able to, to do with that. Um, and I uh, still cannot share my screen. Um, so, if you are interested, um, after this presentation, you're like, oh, I'm all in on nature journaling. I want more of this. I want to invite people to join the Nature Journal Club. That's a Facebook group that is, um, ah, I can share my screen. You're good to go, Jack. Um, so you can join the Nature Journal Club. Um, that is a, um, a, an online group of people doing this. Um, you can also be, look for more nature journaling opportunities, a bunch coming with the Sonoma Land Trust. So here we go. Um, what I want to do is I'm first going to show you just a few pages from my, my own journal. And we're going to take a look at, at journals of, 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 of a few other interesting scientists and naturalists. Um, I submit to you that keeping your journal, this is a log that uses words and pictures and numbers to describe your experiences, your adventures, the things that you're curious about, is the number one thing that you can do to improve not just the way that you think, um, the way that you interact with nature, um, it'll allow you to get so much more out of it, but also to improve your memory of the experiences. So keeping a nature journal is it's actually not about the book itself. Um, the book could get eaten by a walrus and you are still okay. Because when you are doing nature journaling, it takes your brain to a higher level. And even if the physical object, the book itself, were to go away, you would still be in great shape. Um, so these are just a few pages from my journals whenever something is happening around me and it really gets me excited. I grab this book because I know that I will get so much more out of that experience if I'm journaling along with it. You think when you have a rich experience, like, oh, I'm going to remember this forever, but our brains don't work that way. Um, and you also kind of have the subjective 
feeling that if I'm looking at something, I'm really taking in as much as I can. But this is just a trick that our brain plays on us. And really, your brain has lots of little sneaky tricks that it uses to kind of, with a minimum of effort, a minimum of energy, kind of make you think that you're doing the best you can. But you could, there's so much more potential inside your brain. So what we're going to do is take a look at a few journal pages. I'm saying this is, this is something that I do, um, but don't take it from me because if you look through scientists and great thinkers in history, all of them kept journals, all of them. And the ones who didn't don't know their names. Um, history and time have forgotten them because they weren't really able to contribute as much. So um, challenge for you, can you name the nature journaler who made this nature journal page? Here's another one by the same person. All right, now, if you, are, if you think you know this, pat yourself on the back. If you're there with your family, discuss these and let the other person know, like, oh, I think it's this, I think it's this. No, 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 it's gotta be this. And if you've got any questions, put them, uh, go in the Q&A sec section and say, was that, boop, 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 all right? So you can, you can add your, your, your comments in there, who you think these are. So this is Nature Journaler number one, one who um, we, we still know and honor today from a long time back. Now this, this is now we're gonna get more challenging. This Nature Journaler is an expert in barnacles, in barnacles. This is part of his study, very careful study of, of the structure and behavior of barnacles. And if you have it just based on this, I am really, really impressed with you. Um, this is a scientist who really contributed um, incredible things to our understanding of the way that natural systems work. Um, if you're puzzled on the barnacle expert, here's one more page by the same person. And what this journal is, is it's all of this person's observations and thinking and ideas coming together on a page. When you get it out of your head and onto the page, your brain, we're gonna be talking more about this, your brain will start to work better. That's naturalist number two. And here's number three. Number three, all right? Do you know this one? Put your best guess into the, the, the comment section and you can also kind of follow other people's. This is number three. Um, We've got a lot of texture on the moon here, and this is actually the first time that that was observed. This person observed that the moon was not a beautiful, perfect sphere, not a perfect orb in the heavens. Got in a lot of trouble. Here's an interesting one. All right, so you can see that this person is, they are thinking in pictures and they're thinking with words, they're thinking with numbers and formulas. All those ideas come together on the page. It's not that one of these systems is better than the other. Pictures aren't better than words. Words aren't better than numbers. They're all different ways of thinking. And the more that you start to integrate these together on your own journal page, you get whatever experience you're having into these forms on your piece of paper. Can you get this one? All right? In the comment section, share your best guess. This this is a challenging one. And yes, you're looking at electrical circuits. Um, and here is, I'll give you a little hint, um, not Edison. No, we're not gonna go that easy on you. So see if you can figure out that one. And if you're feeling really cocky because you got everything else, here's, here's one, but notice just, just pause for a second and notice that all these people, they're using pictures, they're using diagrams, they're using words. This, this is the real challenging one. This is the real tough one. And you might have to get really close to your screen. And in the bottom, the bottom corner, um, uh, this person has figured out that there are these elements and they're moving in a spiral arrangement. And then see those little three dots? That's the little therefore symbol. Therefore, in, in bold letters, the person wrote helix, right? Um, this is a moment of discovery recorded on paper. And it is not Watson or Crick. It's not Watson or Crick. So all of these scientists who contributed so much to the way we think and work today, 
they, they are using journals. And if you too are using a journal, um, you know, you, you want, you say like, wouldn't it be nice to think like Leonardo da Vinci? Yes, that was the first one. Um, well, if you want to think like Leonardo da Vinci, start acting like Leonardo da Vinci. And that means start keeping a notebook, words, pictures, numbers, all playing there together. And we're going to see what happens. All right. So first, what are you going to put on your page? You've got your journal. You have a journal. What are you going to put onto the pages of your journal? I'm going to suggest three, try that again, three. <laughs> um, I wish that that were an accident, but that, I mean, on purpose, but that was, this kind of happened. So um, I'm going to suggest three different critical things. You want to get anything that you notice, anything that catches your curiosity, anything that you're wondering about. And, and the journal is going to enhance your ability to observe. The journal is going to enhance your ability not just to ask questions, but to hold on to the questions that you really ask. And the third little piece of this is creativity. So here's, but by creativity, here's what I mean. My definition of creativity is your ability to make useful connections between seemingly unrelated things. So useful connections between seemingly unrelated things. And so you want to train your brain to be a networker. And the more that you do this on things that you're looking at, what is this like? What is this similar to? Why is it similar to that? How is it different than that? Why is that? The more that you can kind of get your brain to practice doing that, the more you will be an automatic connector in your brain. And that is a very powerful place to go. So as nature journalers, we have a little mantra that helps us remember this. And that is, you probably heard this before, I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of. So I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of. I write that into the back of just about every journal I have. And when I'm in front of any object, that's what I do. What I'm doing is I'm sitting down going, what do I notice? I see something, I record it. I notice another thing, I record it. I hear something, I record it. I try to get everything that I notice down there on paper. The next level is those observations are going to stimulate questions. And so what you're going to do is put those questions down on paper as well. Don't expect yourself to remember even your best questions. So um, when a question occurs to you, write that down right there in your journal. Some people will write it next to, like they've got a picture of, of something that's interesting and they've, they're, they're drawing that and they'll write the question, they'll draw a little line pointing to that part. Other people will just have a little running list, a bullet point list of questions running down the side of the paper. It's really up to you. I know one great nature journaler who will color code these big kind of bubble question marks and will color code the, the, um, those, 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 those questions um, where like, let's say there's, they're drawing something and it's mostly pink. Then the questions that are related to that on the page, you'll see these kind of big pink bubble question marks. It's a pretty cool strategy. The last piece it reminds me of, intentionally look for connections and relationships between things and then get those down on paper, right? So some natural object shows up in front of you. You just, even before I grab my, my, my piece of paper, I start with, I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of, just try that with this feather here. Um, what do you notice? What do you see? And you try to just get this stream of consciousness riff of observations. And... Um, what can you say about that? What else? What else? And then what? And then what? Now, if you're just doing this in your head, what happens is you'll notice a couple of things and you, then you'll feel like, well, that feels satisfying. I've got it. And even if you keep staring at it, your brain, here's the crazy thing, will just start keeping kind of noticing the same thing again and again and again and again. Um, so to get out of that little loop, you put it down on a piece of paper. Then your brain goes, oh yeah, we already got that. Let's go on to the next thing. Same with your questions. Same with your it reminds me of us but it's all kind of comes from you find some phenomenon in nature. And what it is, it's the dance between nature, that, that phenomenon that you found, and your brain. The next step is how. So here's this experience. I notice, I wonder what it reminds me of. I want to get that into my journal. I'm going to suggest to you that you use three languages. So, and I've listed them here, the words, the pictures, and the numbers. Each one of these will get your brain to think in a profoundly different way. One of these is probably going to be your comfort zone. Maybe you're a drawer, 
All right, so you sit down and you draw something and you look through your journals and it's drawing, 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 drawing. Okay, that's great. There's nothing wrong with doing that. But if you start writing in addition to that, there's this whole area of other stuff that is going to open up for you. Some stuff is hard to draw, right? And there's some stuff where you're like, I can't really, I don't know how I'd even start to draw that. And, and so what you do then is you don't draw it. You don't record it because it's difficult for you to express with that medium. Now bring in words and the whole thing opens up to a whole new level. And the last bit is numbers. So some of us got scared of numbers early on because, because we were taught math in the wrong way. We were taught math in a way that was all about calculation and performance instead of about thinking with symbols. And, but numbers are just, they're a language for describing the world and they are as beautiful as the world that they describe. And here on Earth Day, we know, we know that that is a really incredible place out there, right? So words, pictures, numbers. And what you can do is as, as you, you can train yourself to get better at each of these skill sets. Within each of them, there are a whole bunch of ideas. Um, you know, you can start to measure things. You now can bring a ruler with you. If you don't have a ruler or some measuring tape, it's hard to measure things. If you've got a watch, all of a sudden you can time things. Um, so um, with words, there are, you can use words as paragraphs, as little just fragments of things. You can use words as a bullet point list. And once you start making a bullet point list, you'll find that the structure of making that list invites you then to put the next thing on your list and then the next thing on your list and then the next thing on your list. So um, the structure of how you're using words makes words different on your page. Um, you see that little label pointing to the lizard. Labels are a whole different way of using words on your page. Um, so those are just two examples of ways you can expand how you use words on your page. Even the title so it says what and how in great big letters, right? Putting titles in on your page will make you think like, what's the big idea here? What are sort of the major concepts that I'm getting across? I start to put those on my page in big, bold bubble letters. Making bubble letters is also fun. Um, and you are, you are off to the races. With pictures, it can be a, a, a diagram of something. It can be a portrait represent, representation of something. It can be a map. Um, it can be a cross section. There's a whole bunch of different ways that you can start to use pictures in your journal. Um, and the, you know, most books on how to draw things are filled with clues about that. Um, so there's lots of good places to go for reference material um, and, 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 and skill suggestions to build that skill set. And it is, drawing is just a skill. So don't, don't fool yourself that, oh, drawing, I don't have the drawing gift. I'm not a natural drawer. It's not my thing. You cannot draw if you don't draw. But if you start drawing on a regular basis, you are going to learn to draw. It's a skill that you're going to be able to, to get just by doing it on a regular basis. The last little piece, that one, two, three, those are the numbers. So start looking for the numbers in nature. Start measuring things, start timing things. Um, is there a way that you could represent those numbers, like that little graph that I made, the 14 through 18, of to, to instead of just having a mis mishmash of data, um, something where you can um, start to visualize the data. And on the Nature Journal Club, people are sharing lots of different cool ideas about ways of, of sharing different aspects of, of quantified observations. Use all of these together. And you're going to build an incredibly rich and incredibly powerful skill set. So what are the basic elements? This is your brain, right? This is your brain on paper, and that's what you want. That's what this is. So the, the what is all these cool processes going on in your brain. That's the I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of. But in, to, what you do is you get out of this brain, and you get it here onto the page, and it goes to a whole new level. Um, just thinking inside your head. Remember your old math teacher who said, show your work, right? Your math teacher was right. You want to show not just the world, but also yourself your work. And your thinking process is going to start to improve.
And that, that leads us into the final little piece of this all, which is why? Why doing this? So at the start, I said that I think that this is the, the number one thing that you can do in order to really supercharge your ability to observe as a naturalist and to get more enjoyment out of the world. Um, what I'm gonna ask you to do is to take 30 seconds right now and just to write down what you think are major big reasons why you would want to do this, why, why you want to be a nature journal. Why should, why should somebody do this? I'm gonna be quiet and write. Get your last idea down on paper. All right, now I'm going to show you a partial list of some ideas that I came up with that I think are good reasons why you should be doing this. Um, you will have others, if there are really cool ones that I've missed or other ones that you want to share, um, type those into the notes and the question and answer. So here's when I was just sort of sitting around in my living room. Um, these were the, the, the major ones that I, I came up with. Um, so for me, I have a hard time, I have a hard time staying focused on whatever it is that I'm doing. But I find when I'm nature journaling, the process of noticing something and getting it down on paper, notice, get it down on paper, notice, get it down on paper, that sucks me into a higher level of presence, of mindful presence with whatever it is that I'm looking at than I can possibly do just standing there on my own two feet. This next one about cognitive load is really, really cool. So your brain has limited capacity to handle stuff. So um, if you've ever tried to multitask do two things at the same time and found that your ability to do one of those things goes down or both of those things goes down, you're, you're right because we, we really don't have that much. We don't, we don't have um, a super big brain. As big as this is, you try to do a couple things at the same time, this brain can't handle that. So, but what you're doing here is, is you notice something, instead of trying to keep that in your mind, instead of, I got to remember that, I got to remember that, I got to remember that. As long as you're trying to do that, you don't have the resources to do anything else. So what you're doing is noticing something and then offloading it to the journal. So you, you get things and you offload them to here. What this does is this makes your brain bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So your brain ends up being as big as the capacity of your journal. And so you get a bigger brain by doing this. So you can get around the kind of the, kind of the cognitive load, the capacity of your brain. Um, also, our memories are terrible. Your memory of even important, critical, life-changing events is going to change over time. So years from now, you're gonna be telling people about what it was like in the days of COVID, and you're gonna be telling the story wrong. That's why if we journal about it, that gives us an anchor for those memories. And you give, you've got yourself kind of a concrete thing that you're then, as your brain is sort of making up stuff and filling in all the gaps in your memory. Um, you um, are, are, are able to, to, to you, you'll be able to kind of keep true to your memories. Um, or just sort of, just kind of going back to one more thing on cognitive load. Um, one of my favorite Gary Larson's, oops, wrong direction. One of my favorite Gary Larson's. Uh, I should have made this larger. Um, but can you see that on your screen? Um, may I be excused? My brain is full. So that's absolutely right. So your brain actually does have a capacity. And when your brain is full, if you try, try, try to do this, try to remember the numbers 8, 9, 74, and purple. Um, 8, 9, 74, purple. Remember that. And I'm going to be asking you about that at the end of this workshop, right? And actually, don't. Don't do that. And the reason I don't want you to do that is because if you are trying to remember that number, hold it in your brain 
and the color, your ability to get anything out else out of this workshop would be really, really decreased. But if you wrote it down on a piece of paper, you're golden. That's why making a grocery list helps so much. So make a grocery list of all the events of your life. Make those lists in your journal and do them with pictures and words and numbers and boom, then you have, see, small brain, big brain, small brain, big brain. You get to use your big brain. Um, I'm just gonna uh, touch on a couple of these other ones. Um, and this idea of metacognition is actually a really interesting one and it deserves a little bit of explanation. If you are just looking out there at nature and you're looking at nature, um, you stare at nature, um, nature stares back, right? And you know, eventually the two of you get tired of staring at each other, it's this staring contest. And, but if you really want to energize your brain, you, want, you need to get something else going on there. You need to get this conversation happening instead of you're just looking and looking and looking and looking and looking. To get your brain to be more dynamic, one of the things that, the idea of metacognition is how can I think about the way that I'm thinking? How can I think about the way that I'm thinking? Now the problem is, if you try to think about the way you're thinking, you're now thinking about thinking about the way that you're thinking. You're no longer actually thinking about the way that you're thinking. Whew. Um, so, but if you get an idea and you put it down on paper, you can look at that on the piece of paper and you go like, oh, you can now actually think about what you're thinking about, right? So the journal is a way of kind of reflection on the self and all of your thinking practices. So if you have a journal, then what happens is, is an interaction with nature becomes this, instead of plunk, I'm looking, it becomes this thing where you're bouncing back and forth between your brain, the journal, whatever it is that you're seeing. And this starts bouncing around and then you make an observation and then you go like, and you write it down and you go like, huh, that's funny. But then you have to look back and you check again. And then that sort of takes you in a different. So the minute you start journaling, your brain becomes much more active because one of the things you can now do is look at yourself thinking. You can actually see yourself thinking. You can go like, wow, I haven't asked a single question in this whole process so far. That's interesting. But it wouldn't have occurred to me if I were sitting here and staring at that woodchuck, right? Um, and the last, a couple of other pieces is that the more you do this, the better you're gonna get at thinking with pictures, the better you're gonna get at drawing pictures. I guarantee you, you say, but I can't draw, don't worry about it, that will come. You just want to start doing this, trust that it will come, give it, by the end of just one year of doing this regularly, boom, you see something, you sketch it, you've got it. And it's so much fun. You kind of get into the flow. And that is what makes nature journaling absolutely magical for me. And that's why I'm absolutely addicted to it and am a journaling evangelist, as you have seen. That's the what, the how, and the why of nature journaling. So now what we're going to do is do, you've got your vegetable, we are all going to do um, a little bit of this ourselves. And um, I am uh, gonna ask you to get your vegetable, get your journal, and everybody's got a different um, object, but we can do the basic process together. And so I'm going to switch my cameras and I'm going to show you, this is the onion cam. And we're gonna uh, journal along with me. And um, I am going to walk you through what my process would be of, of playing along with, with something like this. I'm gonna use this object. You can use um, yours at, at, at home. So, I am going to, I often encourage people to start with whatever your comfort zone is. So if um, your comfort zone is writing, you might just sort of start with a little bullet list down the side of the page. I notice this, I notice this, I notice this, I notice this, I notice this. All right, for me, a lot of my comfort zone is, I like drawing pictures. So I'm going to draw a little picture. I'm gonna start with kind of one focal picture here, and then you're gonna see how I'm using some different strategies to kind of build on this. And what I often like to do is, um, 
you know, I'm going to draw this really life size of so it's here. I've got, um, so I'm essentially, I'm kind of just giving myself a few little landmarks to get this thing kind of up and, and running. So it has, there's a little color. I'm looking at it from a slightly different angle than you are. Um, and I usually start lightly. Um, here I'm starting with a, a little light pencil and um, blocking in these, these pieces. And then I'll be coming over that probably with a pen because it doesn't really smear as much. Um, and I'm not at this stage really worried about having to, to make, uh, to put in any details. This kind of drawing, um, uh, you want, no, you want to be kind of curved here. Um, this, this kind of, of drawing, I'm just wrapping in the basic shape of, of whatever I get. Give myself a few guidelines to help me remember that's a sphere down there. So um, this drawing is not detailed, but it gives me my basic shape. Um, You'll see if you look, look through a lot of my, my work that for many things that I'm, I'm, I'm sketching, that I'll, I'll, I'll start with something that gives me that, that light shape first. Um, now I'm going to switch over to a pen. Um, something that I like about working with a pen is that it helps me not get as fussy. Um, if I make a mistake, and I will, you'll see me make some mistakes during the course of this, and you'll sort of see how I just kind of get myself to like, oh, that's a mistake, cool, and I'm going to roll with it. So I'm, as I'm doing this, I'm counting the parts, I'm looking at um, the shapes that I have sticking up here. Another trick that I'll often do is when it's really close to me here, um, I will often close one eye when I am looking up at it. And what that does is makes it easier for me to see this as a, as a two-dimensional shape. On my piece of paper, I'm drawing a two-dimensional shape. And, well, this is kind of neat. If you actually listen to me talk, you can hear, I, I think this is kind of an interesting phenomenon, you can actually hear cognitive load happening because the act of talking takes mental effort and energy. The act of drawing does and so you see you'll you'll hear that when I am more challenged by part of a drawing that my speech will slow <laughs> and I will start you know you'll hear that sort of a, a thing going on um, it's kind of neat to see to to experience exactly when somebody's brain is slowing down um, or kind of getting to the uh, capacity that it has. Now, there is, uh, if as you're making a drawing, you start to feel pressure, you start to feel like, ah, oh no, that's not right, I don't like that. Um, you start to kind of really, get wrapped around the axle about making part of a drawing look pretty. Um, what I suggest is I'll teach you kind of the Jedi mind trick um, for how to get your brain to reframe 
there are a few little veins that go up this, and I'm going to put those in here um, to get your brain to reframe what it is doing. Uh, maybe we can even zoom in. There we go. Um, if I'm drawing, 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 my brain will start to go like, I've got to make this into a pretty picture. I've got to have a pretty picture. And if I, and I don't want to do that because that will just give me journal paralysis. So the minute I do this and I draw a little line in here and I go like this, I'm gonna write purple spot. And then I'm going to write in a question. And I think the way that Fiona does, I'm going to color this purple later. I'm going to write in um, why color here. What does purple pigment do All right so what i did is i just i just wrote on the page and you see how by putting this in this whole thing becomes more interesting whoa this now it's not just pictures that have to carry all the weight it is there's also i have these words and i can get my thinking in here i can get observations i've got questions this is where the minute you start doing this and writing on your page, all this pressure starts to, to, to go off. So on your vegetable, oh, here's, I'm going to show you another little trick over here. See how this has this, these papery layers on the bottom? If I draw these papery layers before I draw this part up here, so if I draw these papery layers first, then I can tuck the rest of the drawing in underneath them. So I often draw, what I do is I call drawing front to back. And so what I will do is I'm going to have a little rough area here. I'm going to draw in these papery layers that's on the bottom. And I don't have its shape exactly right, but I am okay with that. Um, that's going to be close enough. for making this useful. All right, so now that I've got those papery layers, I can start to wrap this stuff down and it tucks underneath the thing that I've already drawn. So you see what I did is I drew I drew the stuff that was closer to me first and then I wrapped that other stuff in in behind it. Now there are some lines that come up and around. Now, <clears throat> notice that it's wrinkly in here. That's hard to draw. So how am I gonna draw that? So think about how you're going to represent that on your page. What are you gonna, what are you gonna do? How can you, you've got something that is an observation that you've made but um, maybe what I can do is I'm going to draw a line around the zone where it's most wrinkly, turn that into a dotted line.
And I'm going to draw a line connecting to that that says um, outside skin. is separated loose and wrinkly All right. I don't know if my spelling is correct I'm, I'm dyslexic and so often my spelling does interesting things um, and I'm okay with that um, so the uh, I, I don't want to not do this because I might not make uh, something that is 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 really pretty. Um, um, I, I, or, I mean, in spelled correctly. So just as I don't want to get wrapped around the axle about I have to make a pretty picture, I don't want to get wrapped around the axle about I'm not going to write that word if I don't know how to spell wrinkly. Um, I'm just going to write wrinkly and I'm going to do my best and maybe it's spelled correctly. Maybe it's not um, Either way, it's good enough for me because it's going to get that idea across um, I am Now going to just add a little bit of color to this you see I've got my sock on my wrist that's for cleaning my brush there's no specific tools that are the right tools for nature journaling um, i i find that if i um you know, whatever is is simple and straightforward and fairly easy for me to use easy to get at in the field where there's a minimum of fuss um, that is going to be what is that's going to be what is the most useful to me um, so i'm going to this is gouache paint that i'm putting on here and i don't have to kind of get in there and draw the whole thing um, I find that sometimes if you have a, a drawing and it's partly finished, that often, see that with that big pause, <laughs> um, that often is, is what you, uh, that, that often is visually really interesting. Wanted to make this kind of a blue green because this is blue green. Maybe it needs to be a little bit bluer. Some more blue in that. Um, there we go. So just having one of those done conveys a bunch of interesting, useful information. Um, I'm going to put in that cool purple spot. So I'm going to show you that purple spot again. And I'm going to color in my question mark. And I'm using the same approach. I'm going to start to kind of work around other parts of the, of the, of the illustration here. Um, anytime I am kind of getting stuck though, um, I need to re return to focusing on what my real objective is, which is to be present and sort of stand in awe and wonder of the world. Anytime I start to get too fussy or, 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 or precious, I need to, to back off and to, uh, to write a few more written notes in. And that really helps me kind of keep in nature journaling mode. I'm going to show you two other ideas um, and then we're going to open this up to, 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 to questions. 
Um, I'm going to look around on this for some part that I think is really interesting. So take a look at this on the underside here. There's this neat sunburst pattern with all these bumps in the middle. Um, I am going to draw, I'm gonna have a little inset down here showing, whoops, <laughs> I have to move this up. So I'm making a little inset box down here showing what is going on right on the bottom. And it's going to help me to have a few little kind of crosshair marks through the middle of this. Here's this guy again. Um, there is a lighter inner part and then that is more bumpy. And then there's a bit of a kind of textured outer ring to this. So what I'm doing is I'm intentionally looking for a part of this structure that I don't really kind of know what I would expect to have happening there. And then from this, and all these little flick marks, I want to imagine a line coming from the center, which direction is it gonna flick out? Um, so here is a, an inset of the bottom part of my, my onion and there's a crack in the skin here. And I have another crack in the skin here and then larger it's going out. Um, oops, you were at the wrong angles. Look, see that one. See, there's an angle. See, that one is pointing here. That's visually confusing to people. I want that line facing this way. So I just kind of came over that a little bit more heavily. Um, add a little bit of purple. to the skin that is out here. And so what I like doing is looking for not the parts that I know, but the parts that I don't know. What, like how should I expect that part to look? I don't know. Well, let's go find out. And, and that, um, I, I like to try to pick some kind of common object. And can I look at it long enough that I start to see the parts of it that are really new to me, that I, I don't know what they, they should be doing. I'm gonna let that dry and I'm gonna come hit it with a little bit of white colored pencil in a little bit. So, um, and then I'm gonna add some written notes. Um, there are small dots, dots at center. And I wonder if those are root bases. Right. Um, so what I've done here is I've done what's called a detail or an inset. And that's a very useful strategy that you can employ. Um, and something that's neat about when you start to add this kind of a detail into any drawing 
is that your this also helps your brain start to think about the page in a different way. Um, your brain will now be thinking about, oh, like where are there other places where I can kind of record information about something? It doesn't have to be all done. And so this, if you're just doing a portrait of something, it has to stand alone and do all the work. Um, and it's rough, dry. Dry. Um, so now notice what language do I not have represented here? Huh. Huh. Right? I have, um, right now, everything is, is words and pictures. Words and pictures. There's no numbers on this. So what I'm going to do is I'm now going to measure in millimeters, because it's such a better system, the length of this longest one here. And that is from the white part out there. That is 98 millimeters. And that's 90, 98 millimeters. And uh, Joe, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Uh, what is today's date? You know, today is April 22nd, 2020, the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. Did you hear that? I'm gonna, I did. You know, what a great day to be looking at nature. <laughs> um, so I, I, I'd forgotten what the, the date is. So fortunately, I've got Joe on my speed dial here. And... Um, he came like old times. <laughs> Are you gonna ask me to spell anything? Um, the, no, I'll just, I'll just for now, I'll just keep my, uh, my, my spelling mistakes. Um, I kind of wrap myself in those and, and, and enjoy them. Um, the uh, oh, this is not dry enough for me to be able to write on with this, this pencil yet. Um, but what I can do is, I'm going to call this one, ah, see what I can do, just giving myself a project. This one, I'm gonna call it A. And I just wrote an A on it. And this little one right here that I colored in, that's gonna be B. And I'm going to measure these over the next few days. And I'm gonna find out how fast, and this one is, Forty, forty-seven, forty-seven millimeters. Um, Jack, can I ask you a question, quick? Um, actually, let, let me first just say one other thing, and then I'm going to hit up. I'm going to kind of break for all your questions and a whole bunch of others. Um, there was something else that I wanted to do in this little study, but I haven't because of a special request. Um, uh, I explained to my daughters that um, what I was going to do is I, I thought it'd be really cool at this point I wanted to take this and slice it right through here and look at you know is there any other green or other coloring what's going on inside this and do some cross-section things because that would be a really cool and appropriate thing to add into this diagram right however um, my daughter Carolyn asked me if we could keep this as a pet and put this onion in our backyard. And so you can't cut up your pets. And so I'm, I'm not going to do that. But on the fruit or vegetable that you have at home, um, you absolutely can. You absolutely can. And um, it's really cool to start to... Uh, learn more about it by getting these inside views of things. Um, even without that, I can do this. This is kind of cool. This, do you see this little curve here in this? I can't do a cut through section, but I am going to do a cross section 
across here. And in cross section, that is uh, from little a and a prime here, it is shaped like this. Isn't that neat? You can kind of get, and there's a. Um, so um, now, I'm sorry, what was your question, Joe? Oh, the uh, one thing that people can consider is if they're doing a cross section is to cro do a cross section from many different views and see if that changes the patterns that are revealed or maybe the seeds that they can count or any any repeating patterns that are like hexagons or circles or pentagons that might be present in the structure of that organism. And but like like you said, don't cut up your pets to find out those things. <laughs> Yeah, some, sometimes you can get a sense of the cross section just by looking at it from the outside. Um, sometimes, uh, though, it requires uh, sacrificing your pet, and um, that would not make Carolyn very pleased with daddy. Um, uh, so why don't, so here's, here's the plan. So you see how I kind of got into this. I went, started with my comfort zone, which is drawing some pictures. I then kind of started to go like, eh, I'm getting wrapped around the axle about this. I got to uh, a better, oh, and then once I did this, it, ah, everything loosened up. The whole thing got more interesting. And then I started thinking about it of like, how can I record more information? The more data I can get about this on one page, the more fun it's going to be. And then what I'm going to do is I can write a title with bubble letters up here. Extra bonus points for this if you can um, come up with a bad pun. So for your title, if you come up with a bad pun for your Nature Journal page, you get mad points uh, from the, the Nature Journal Club when you post that on the Nature Journal Club. So um, I'm going to see if I can come up with a bad onion pun. You gotta, might help me with that. Um, but I'm going to add other written notes and things all over this page. But you kind of see how it, how it goes. I didn't really start with a plan, but, I'm, but an understanding and appreciation of this thing is, is emerging. I don't have to finish it. Um, you're going to find that if you get, end up with a journal and you've got a whole bunch of pages where you just started something, just started something, and then you start to feel like, I need to finish these before I can go on and do some new things, you're not going to want to do any journal pages. So that just slows you down, clenches you up, and um, so you don't have to finish any pages. Um, but... I find that when I, when I find something like this and I start messing around with it, this becomes even more fascinating. I'm like, well, why that? What's going on with that? How does, you know, the, the more that you mess with something, the more you're going to see in it. There's an infinite amount of, in, of complexity and intrigue in every little vegetable in your refrigerator, every little crazy thing going on outside your door. And your mission, your challenge, is to, to try to, to, to find a way that those start to come out and dance with you and kind of light up in your brain. And journaling is such a powerful way of getting your brain to do that. Should we see if there are any questions? Do we have time to do that? Or have I kind of monologued all the way through our, our session? We're doing great. We have some time for questions. I have a few that I've uh, kind of lumped together that were in similar themes. Would you like me to kind of present them to you as they've come across? All right. So uh, does, it, does it start with a, a polar bear and a marshmallow in a snowstorm? You know, there's a couple questions that are similar to, to that. And they're about people who are having challenges drawing things that are the same color and how to make them seem like they're coming up out of the page. And I think that's true. There was one for a calla lily was an example. The, I think they're, they were bringing up the fox on the snow. Um, yeah. They're being humorous, but also yeah. it's, it's a real challenge. And I know yeah. you and I how, talked about how to draw about waterfalls that. and things like that too, that are difficult. Um, so first be aware that if you took a photograph of something and had one of these photographs that's completely in focus 
it has no sense of depth in it. And it's a photograph. So if you had a photograph, you'd have the same problem. Um, there are a few strategies that people can use. Um, and I, I'll show you, give you a few suggestions. One is looking for places where elements overlap and in your drawing clearly show what happens when this shape is overlapping this shape. So let me, uh, don't worry, I'm still here. Hey Joe, remember when we used to teach with whiteboards? Uh, used to. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's say you have uh, one petal of your lily and it's doing something like that. You have another petal of your lily and it's doing something like that. This then becomes this really ambiguous area. And you want this to be as clear as, as, as possible. So if you look and one of them isn't overlapping, then you show it kind of coming to a V. But if one actually is on top of the other, what you do is you want to make that clear on your picture. So if this line here comes in and it connects like that, then I have this pedal on top of this one. Let me show you where I get into trouble though. If I draw this line slightly different direction, and it comes down like this. Now, ambiguous. Is this one in front? Is this one in front? But if this one is clearly in front, if I can just have that element clearly overlapping, um, that, helps, that helps a lot. Um, there are other things you can do with your line weight. So for instance, I'm gonna jump back to the document camera here and um, in my book, uh, Nature Drawing and Journaling, there's a, there's a, a few tricks. Um, there's actually a page of showing depth and those are all kind of put together. So in this, I want this to be in front of these ones back here. Notice how this one that I've colored, it has a slightly thicker line. See that? Mm -hmm. This part here that's in front, this has a slightly thicker line than these other elements in back. That thicker line does a lot to suggest that this is an element that's in the foreground, this is an element that's in the background. I can suggest that just right in here I want this to be kind of cl more clearly in front. By strengthening that line, that puts that element closer to the front. I, I'll do the same right down here. Same line width. I've got overlap working for me, but let's see what I can do with line width. If I just take this and I reinforce that right through there, that little bit of heavier line Helps that see that is that's in front. Oh, here's a here's here's an example of a tangent. Look at this. Look at this. I'll, I'll show you. Like, see how this is confusing. This line comes down here, and what I wanted to have is this little papery edge coming up like this. But see how they come to this one little junction there, and then this could be interpreted as the edge of the onion or the edge of the little papery thing, right? So that becomes a visually confusing point. If I just pull that down like that, ah, problem resolved, right? That is now the thing that's in front. Do you see how I did that? So yes. I can, um, use my line weight and uh, I can also use the um, the overlap to make 
parts of something less visually confusing. Um, but in uh, Law's Guide to Nature Drawing and Journaling, um, there are, there's a bunch of other tricks that you'll be able to, to, to see in there that you can use to uh, also help you be able to do that. Jack, we're, we're running out of time here and I had three questions. You can decide which one to answer here and we'll try to answer the other ones in the back. Uh, one is the, the emotional challenge of, I beat myself up whenever I draw because it's not perfect. Or um, another way this came up is that the birds and the critters are moved so fast, I never finish the drawing. Uh, how do you overcome that challenge? Because it's a big part of the mental challenge to stay focused and have your mindset be in there observing. When, yeah, and, why, yeah. when do you, how do you choose or how do you deal with that uh, filter or that mind block of it not being perfect or you're not finishing something that moves quickly? That's, that's a huge, huge question and, and really, really, really important. So whoever was asking that is asking something that just kind of goes to the heart of this, especially grownups we identify ourselves by our areas of competency, by what we know, what we can do well. And so we tend to do those things. And things that where it is um, a new thing for us, those are actually threatening to us. And so we don't like to do those. So one reason why kids learn so much stuff is because they're not afraid of starting new things. Um, and so people will, will say like, you know, but, but you, you can only like learn a new language when you're really young. No, it's just that the grownups are chicken and we beat ourselves up whenever something is like, well, that's not right. And that little kind of voice comes on your shoulder, like, like, this is not an onion. You think that this is onion. No, bad onion. This is a terrible onion. Who are you kidding? Right. And and you start to really, the more you listen to that voice, the more it just shuts you down. And, and it's, it's, it's scary. That voice, by the way, doesn't go away. It'll just kind of reappear in, 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 in new things. It will, but, and so, but when it comes up, um, you have to be ready and willing to, 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 to stop and and redirect it and say like like look um this isn't about making a pretty picture this this is about me being present in nature and observing something new i'm trying to can i look at this in new ways that gives me actually that makes me lose my breath at a moment of beauty or interest or wonder and it actually is in here there's there's Onions have layers, um, and 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 you peel back the right one. There's a surprise, something that you never knew, and being willing to stand in that place of, I'm not an expert. Um, I am a I'm a beginner at this, and it's not going to look pretty, but I'm going to learn something. So intentionally moving the goalpost for yourself from, I've got to make a pretty picture. I move the goalpost over to, I want to learn something. I want to discover something. I want to see something. I want to be curious in, in new ways. And you have to keep forcing yourself to make that switch, make that switch, make that switch. And eventually what happens is um, you, you're, going to, you're going to fake it till you make it. And eventually your brain goes like, oh, we really are nature journaling here. It's not about that pretty picture. Okay, you go ahead with this nature journaling thing. I thought you were doing like capital A art. And, 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 and so I was messing with you about that. But the minute your brain realized like this is nature journaling. And, and part of that is just being willing to, I'm going to quickly get something down on paper. And it may not look good. And that's okay. Um, it gives you permission to make lots of pictures. I, I like that very and much. This is, oh, sorry, go ahead. So it gives you permission to make lots of pictures. And then when you make lots of pictures, your brain gets practice and it gets better at drawing. So the, the, the better at drawing comes automatically just by doing this on a regular basis. But anytime you start to get stressed out about a drawing, 
say it's no longer a drawing, it is now a diagram, and draw lines from part of it, put labels on those, get a more of a density of information on that page. So the drawing is supporting part of that, the words are supporting part of that, the numbers are supporting, all those things are going on there together. And then ah, you are able to, um, you're able to keep going. And, but, and, and the more you do this, the better it'll, it'll get. And drawing things that move, that is, that's more challenging. Like this, I can like put it back in that same position that I was drawing it and it cooperates. It's growing slowly, but not at a rate that um, is gonna kind of interrupt my drawing. So with, when we're drawing things that move, there are techniques and methods that we use to kind of handle that. We often get an understanding of what the anatomy is. We figure out what are the essential points to initially focus on. I get those three lines down. I can draw the rest of the basic shape from memory. But I got in the field the basic emphasis of that, that posture. Um, we, you can learn how to do all those things. On my website, johnmuirlaws.com, I have hours and hours of free tutorials on exactly these sorts of things on drawing birds that move, on mammal anatomy, on putting those things together. So, but I would say start with something that you can hold in your hand and just pick up and it's not gonna go tearing off. Um, it's not gonna fly away into another bush. But do know that the more that you do this, the easier that's going to come to the point where you can look at something and very, very quickly get down uh, the oomph of this thing. Yeah, I really like that idea. You and I did a trick a couple of years ago, and I'm going to wrap this. I'm going to start wrapping things up after this statement. Um, the uh, just putting up a slideshow of birds because because seagulls telling the difference between different types of seagulls in the Bay Area because there's so many dozens type, dozens of types of gulls. I will just flash. I'll have a slideshow and show the picture of the seagull for three seconds. Then I'll do a speed drawing. How fast? Can, how many details can I know? So I make it a a gamify it, and that takes a lot of the stress about. Am I making a piece of art that needs to hang in a museum in a frame? And I, that helps me get rid of that. It becomes more of a, a little challenge for myself. The, uh, the, the things that, some other questions people had were, um, what were those pens, those water pens were, you were using? And there'll be links to those uh, materials and items. You describe those uh, on your um, website. I believe that's the Niji brush. I call it Niji brush, but a water, water brush. Um, oh, no, I, I, this is the, the it's, uh, I don't recommend the Niji one. I recommend the Pen yeah. one. Um, oh, and there's, if you go to johnmuirlaws.com, there is a page, a link there that says nature journaling. And under that, you'll find suggested equipment. You can yeah. also buy this specific brush on my website. It's my favorite nice. brush. Um, so you can go there and pick up your brushes. And... Uh, before we, I close this, uh, those, there's some journals you, said their names at the beginning. Could you reiterate who those journalists were? Uh, people missed some of those and then we'll uh -huh. this up. All right, um, so here we go. So the, the, the first one, um, we had um, Leonardo da Vinci. All right. Came up. Um, Leonardo da Vinci was followed by, um, what were, was that, was that the picture of the moons? There was pictures of the moons and there was illustrations of flowers that may have been Linnaeus. I wasn't sure. Oh, 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 the barnacle guy. The barnacle guy. The barnacle. That was okay, right, right. Darwin. The barnacle guy. Barnacle. Darwin. You can see in that second one, there's a little kind of tree like diagram. And next to it, in, in sort of tentative script, he writes, I think, and it's this sort of branching tree. And you can sort of see the start of some of his, his ideas um, happening right there. The, the moon guy was Galileo. Right. Um, Nikolai Tesla was doing that diagram of um, all the, the circuitry. Right. Um, and um, the, um, the, the, the one with the, the helix, that was Rosalind Franklin. Right. The person who discovered the structure of DNA, um, but was snubbed for a Nobel because she was female. And she but, was, she was sketching those from microscope pictures. And somebody asked about this earlier: How do I be safe when drawing, like a bear or a wasp? Uh, we use telescopes and microscopes and binoculars to allow us to get those views. And she was using X-ray crystallography 
to help her understand that and then drew her understanding to summarize it, which is, I think was such an elegant illustration of how to see what the technology cannot. Yeah. Yeah, it's nice that when, when we, the, because it involves your brain, when you are, when you're drawing something, you have to, you have to get your brain in there and wrap around this thing. And you don't really have it until it kind of can come in and then come back out. Um, you'll see the same sort of thing. Like if you read a story and you're not then able to kind of explain and discuss it with someone, you don't really have that. You don't really have a poppy until you can kind of take that poppy in and then that poppy can come back out. Um, it's, 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 it's a very powerful thing to kind of improve your way of, of thinking and interacting with the world around you. Such a parallel to map making, you're, you're telling a story, but you're, when you're sitting on the workbench, there's shavings and bits and parts that you've chipped through or left over or like a marble maker's workshop, you're chipping away the marble to get at the form or on the weaver, you're adding things together to get the form. Or if you're the map maker, you're just kind of laying things over top of each other to see the relationships. But all of them end up with this pile of shavings and trimmings like a, like a tailor shop. And that you should, that process, that pile, that mess, tells you a little bit about yourself and your thinking. The thing you have at the end is the story you're trying to tell. There's a lot of chipping and gnawing and chewing along the way that uh, that is actually fantastic to see that shouldn't be thrown away. And I think that will help people once they have that mindset, get away from the obstacle of perfectionism. Yeah, I, I like your analogy there. And it's that pile of shavings that I think is the most interesting part. Um, yeah. What are all the decisions that you went through in order to get there? I, that's why I often like looking through somebody's journal. You get a chance to look through somebody's journal. That for me is a lot more interesting than, um, than if you just, uh, than, than seeing some sort of final painting that they have. Um, you can see somebody kind of trying to wrap their brain around something and can they, can, how can they understand this in, in a more dynamic way? The, this again, this is your live thinking process. And, and so it's this dance between, you know, the stuff comes out of nature and into your brain, then it comes down here, then bounces back into your brain, and then you're looking back at nature and, and it is, it's a reflection of that dance, a reflection of that process. Um, I, I find that to be the, just the, yeah, the, the real goal and the gold of this. Yeah. So you are so much, the book that you get, um, it is the thinking that you're involved in in order to get you there. Yeah, that is the gold. You're really mining for nuggets. And thank you, Jack, very much for sharing your experience, uh, the, the potholes and pits to avoid in this process, and really joining with us, um, uh, joining together for us the relationship of ourselves to the land so that when we're getting back out beyond looking through our window, that we can take these skills and reapply them and keep practicing. I want to say thanks to everybody who joined us today. We really want to see your work. If you've made something or submitted to it, I'm like, I'm sure somebody out there thought maybe they wanted to smear that beautiful red color of the onion onto their page and see if that actually made color. Let's show us those things of where you experimented or how wide is that zucchini that you picked out of the drawer? Or you may have something strange or odd or that you were working on that we had, we would really be curious to see. So post that to us. Uh, there's a link there on, on that page there. Uh, we'll, we have these really cool little pocket nature journals. Um, everybody has a different size of nature journal that works for them. These are really attractive ones that fit in a shirt pocket for when you're out there on the go and um, have a quick place to, to note things down. If you want to learn more about this, Jack has brought this up a couple times, so I want to reiterate it. Go to johnmuirlaws.com and there's things answers to the questions about which tools you're using, which brushes, which gouache you're using, uh, where to get these materials, please go there, as well as the fantastic library of great videos that are equally as informing, informative as this presentation you gave here today. Uh, and then share with us. We'd love to share with others. We've um, 
you and I both agree that this work of observation is about enhancing that love for a place. And we know that when you love something, you are inspired to care for it. And that translating that love and that care into action, that's a really important part of how you and I see our obligation to motivating people to do this. Because the Sonoma Land Trust, we, we protected about 50,000 acres of land. The maps I drew and draw help facilitate that those stories help us engage or motivate us or to see the details of why this special place is important uh, what the name of it is how many acres it is what plants and animals live there and through your support um, you help make this work possible you help make us enable to protect over 50,000 acres and combined with all the other land trusts and parks and regional um, groups we take care of a lot of the Bay Area, and we want to see that open and accessible by you when you're able to return to it after your, your door gets opened and you can do something other than grocery shop. Um, uh, so please send us those pics, share with us. We'd like to see what you got, and uh, we got a little bonus gift there for you. Uh, there's We saw your website, and then uh, consider if you want, um, besides donating your experience, uh, there's a chance to give a little cash, throw some money into the pot and help us um, help us buy some of that land, help us protect some of that land for all kinds of reasons. Uh, ecosystems that we depend upon, opportunities for access, volunteering opportunities, public recreation, agricultural pre preservation, places where agricultural areas are at risk of being developed into something other than a food resource. Outdoor education, learning more about this place, having a place to go outdoor to, to learn it. There's so many parks and marshes and forests that uh, still are available to us because of that hard work to protect it. Um, so go ahead to our website at snowmalandtrust.org. There's a donate button if you want to donate there. Uh, uh, but the last part I want to say is that uh, land conservation benefits our whole community. It really does. And thank you so much for during these uncertain times, it's nice to know we are trying to preserve something for the long Paul, for the long, the long, um, for everybody's use for the long, long term. Um, and we really appreciate you and everyone supporting our work and your work. And if you donate, you become a member of Stumble Interest uh, and you join in this community who believes that land is worth protecting. You'll receive invitations to special outings and events and special volunteer opportunities if you'd like. But best of all, we're all working together to protect nature forever. So thank you very much, Jack, and thank you all for participating. This is gonna end our presentation and I look forward to it and go ahead and check the video if you didn't catch the beginning. Have a good day. Have Thanks. a great Earth Day. Bye-bye.